uh, is at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute and um, is interested in sort of, I almost would say, social ecological systems. And um, I became aware of some of the kinds of things that she's going to talk about at a, uh, uh, an AFS session that uh, she and Lisa Kerr organized. Um, and then also, Kathy um, has the distinct honor of having become a Pew conserva Marine Conservation Fellow. So um, it's a very nice award and recognition. So I'm going to take it, uh, give her the mic now. All right. All right. Well, thank you um, for the invitation to be here with you today. Um, it's a real honor. To be here for this meeting, especially since I got my start working in the Hudson, and it's such a beautiful system, it's great to come back. Um, but I am going to be talking with you about work that I'm currently doing. Um, I'm based at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, but this work, similar to Janet's work, will be work that's relevant at the scale of the Northeast Shelf. So this um, focuses on um, potential climate vulnerabilities and adaptation strategies for fishing communities along the Northeast Shelf as we see fish shifting um, with warming ocean waters. I want to just start by acknowledging that I'm going to be focusing on one particular project for a large portion of my talk today, and this project is a huge team effort. So even though I'm standing here presenting it to you, I want to acknowledge the effort of many other folks who um, span many disciplines who have contributed to this project, um, both in terms of the research, but also in terms of the community engagement work that we've been doing, which has been really important for shaping some of the research directions and hopefully for getting information out to potentially be used moving forward. So Janet did a great job of introducing us to the Northeast Shelf. Uh, I put this in here because I recognize many folks here will be more riverine focused. Um, but essentially for this work, we are focusing on the region spanning from the Gulf of Maine all the way down to Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. So our work tends to, for this project, tends to focus on Virginia and North so that we pick up the whole state, um, which um, North Carolina gets split in the survey when you um, think about where that break occurs. So I'm going to spend a bit of time setting up our motivation for moving into thinking about potential impacts of climate-driven ecosystem changes on fishing communities. And the motivation really stemmed from seeing changes in the ecosystem that were quite dramatic. So we have seen on the Northeast Shelf an incredibly rapid warming of the ocean sea surface temperatures. So this is the time series pulled from the optimal interpolated sea surface temperature data record um, that NOAA maintains goes back to 1982. And you can see that there's quite a bit of variability, but particularly in the last period, there is a dramatic, um, a, a very strong trend. When we look at the trend from 82 through present across the whole time series, you know, it, it, it doesn't look that dramatic, about 0 0.03 degrees Celsius of warming per year. But when you think about that and its comparison to global warming, we're seeing global rates that are three times slower. So globally, ocean temperatures are warming about one degree every 100 years here, about every 30 years. Um, and then also, I just want to point out, I didn't put it on the figure, but if you look at the past decade, the warming rate has been really dramatic, almost 0.2 degrees Celsius per year. And Although that is sort of arbitrary to isolate in the, from the perspective of a long-term temperature time series, it has a lot of relevance when you think about connections between temperature and the ecosystem. So it's a time period over which we've been able to see quite dramatic ecosystem responses to the warming. We also expect um, that this warming will likely continue into the future. So this is a figure um, looking at the where warming rates for different pixels around the oceans across the globe fall in terms of percentiles. So on here in yellow, for example, everything that shows up in yellow, yellow orange, is warming faster than about 0.95% of the rest of the ocean. And we expect this to be a hot spot for warming into the future as well. So the Northeast Shelf um, is right here showing up in bright yellow in this climate projection from some work that Ben Saba led um, to look out into the future. We see this region being an area that we expect to have particularly strong warming rates as we move forward. 
So in addition to the warming trends, we've also had significant short-term events. The 2012 ocean heat wave that we experienced in this region was an event that extended from Cape Hatteras up to Iceland and all the way north into the Labrador Sea. And over the spatial area, um, summer temperatures were running two to three degrees Celsius warmer than the long-term average. And we saw ecosystem and fishery impacts of this heat wave just within that season in Maine, particularly within the Maine lobster fishery and also ecosystem changes that have been documented in other regions of that area, or other portions of that region um, in that year as well. And then also I want to point out that, you know, it's not just about the magnitude of warming, we're also seeing warming um, occur earlier in the spring and cool down occur later in the fall, so with a period that feels like summer is expanding. And this is, um, you know, expanding by about two days per year in the Gulf of Maine since 1982, which is really quite a lot. You know, summer now is about two months longer than it was back in 1982. So it's really important implications, especially for predator-prey interactions, um, which Janet started um, mentioning in her talk as well. So as a result of some of the physical changes, we're seeing a lot of biological impacts, um, changes in the ecosystem and populations from protected species like Atlantic salmon to many fishery species and to some aquaculture species being affected by changing pathogens and disease. So widespread effects. Um, and we're also seeing those extend into fisheries. So I mentioned that in 2012, the heat wave um, affected the main lobster fishery. It caused the landings that year to come online really early, really strong landings very early in the season, and the supply chain just wasn't prepared to handle that um, influx of landings so early. So triggered effects in the fishery. We're seeing some traditional populations like Atlantic cod and northern shrimp decline. Mixed effects for things like um, American lobster that have a southern population that's not doing well and a northern population that is doing better. And I'm going to contradict Janet just a minute here um, because I think we are also seeing fishery, fisheries respond to these changes. This shows um, where summer flounder is being caught on the water. Um, Janet alluded to some work by Malin Pinsky which is really focused on where things are being landed. But when you look at where fishermen are operating on the water, what we see here in blue is really where um, summer flounder was being caught back in the late 1990s. And the red shows where it's being caught in, the, um, in 2011 through 2013. So you can see that the concentration of summer flounder catch has also shifted northward. And we see this pattern for many of the faster moving species, for fisheries targeting those species. Also some differential there, of course, um, depending on vessel characteristics. So large vessels can track the fish better than smaller <coughs> vessels, obviously. Um, and we're not only um, anticipate that we are experiencing these changes just for now, and maybe things will revert to what we think is normal. When we project these out into the future, for a number of species where there has been really in-depth work um, conducted, we also see these changes playing out into the future as warming continues. So for American lobster, I'm showing here the um, population trends for the southern New England stock and the Gulf of Maine stock. You can see that southern New England has already declined quite dramatically um, as that ecosystem has warmed. There may be some recovery under low warming scenarios in the future, but um, continued downward trend if there is stronger warming. And in the Gulf of Maine, we expect to see the American lobster population being negatively affected by warming into the future. There's also been some really good work on a number of different species. I'm going to highlight just um, sea scallops here, some work that was led by Sarah Cooley. And what I like about this study is that it goes not just to what's happening with the population, what will that mean for fisheries? So getting at landings effects, and this is really what we're trying to move toward in the work that I'm going to describe to you. Um, today. So as we've seen all these changes, we really started asking the question, you know, what will this mean for people, people who are involved in these fisheries, and for the communities that those fisheries are tied to? And also, what, what do they need to look ahead? What kinds of information 
could we provide to them to enable them to plan ahead and think about strategies that might be useful into the future. So this is the project I'm going to describe today is really our first attempt to go down this road and we're certainly learning a lot as we do this about what kinds of information people want and how that might change as they see what certain pieces of information looks like. So this is really a learning process as much as it is uh, a delivery process. So, um, so we moved into thinking a lot about climate adaptation and adaptation means thinking about not just what will the um, impacts be of a change that may come at you and how could you buffer that impact, but what could you do to take advantage of new opportunities that might arise? And I think that as we think about climate change in marine ecosystems, how it affects fisheries, thinking about those new opportunities will be an important part of the puzzle. So some of the elements of adaptation um, that are central to this concept rely on understanding vulnerabilities and risk, um, identifying and evaluating or assessing potential adaptation options, um, providing information to support decisions, and then also understanding what outcomes you're trying to achieve and which strategies will help you get there. So um, adaptation can also occur on many scales because fisheries operate across many different scales. So you have individual fishermen who are making decisions based on their local conditions at short time scales, communities who are focused very locally but are making investments in their shoreside infrastructure and um, developing policies that are intended to last for decades. We have fisheries operating across multiple communities over a region and then a management system obviously that takes a higher level perspective operates over longer time scales and larger spatial scales. But in all of these, they're making decisions that will be affected by climate change. Fishermen are deciding, you know, do they stay or do they go? Do they continue participating in a fishery? Do they move to something else? Do they continue fishing where they have been fishing? Do they move to a different location? Communities are making infrastructure investments and the shoreside infrastructure element of this is um, something I hadn't really expected to be so important, but I'm learning a lot about coastal infrastructure decisions going through this work. Fisheries are thinking about how they operate on the water, what they harvest and different harvest levels, and obviously that intersects with the management system. The management system also works around not just setting, you know, harvest levels that align with the biological system, but thinking about access and allocation of that harvest to different groups and then also attempting to function in an environment where trends are driving the system as a whole and thinking about how to account for those trends. So the work that um, we've been doing quite a bit of work through one particular project which is the focus of my talk today. This is a project that's funded by NOAA through their Coastal and Ocean Climate Applications Program and in this project we have four different key objectives. One is to look across the Northeast Shelf, so for about 120 different fishing communities, what is their relative vulnerability to some of the changes in species that are occurring due to ocean warming, and um, how does that vary for different regions? Then um, we'll be do I'll explain some work that we're doing on evaluating the social and economic impacts of changes in species availability in the region, as well as evaluating adaptation strategies that they might employ to buffer some of those impacts. And finally, um, looking at factors that could enable or hinder adaptation um, across you know, the community and institutional and management systems that we have in place. So the first part of this work is a vulnerability assessment. It's a coupled social and ecological vulnerability assessment where we attempt to understand changes in the ecological system, how they connect with the social system, and what the final um, integrated result looks like in terms of joint vulnerability. So for this work, we are using the RPC 8.5 climate scenario, climate models driven by that scenario, projected out to the year 2055, so mid-century. Then we ask a series of three questions. So the first question it's really trying to understand how the ecological system will respond to those climate futures. And the first question in here is um, really how will species availability change? So we do this by pulling together first some work that's been done 
through a qualitative species vulnerability assessment that John Hare at the Northeast Fishery Science Center led. And basically they looked across many different species and considered a variety of life history features and potential ways they could be affected by climate change, not just temperature, but also pH change, um, sea level rise, um, other conditions as well, and basically scored these species in terms of how exposed to climate conditions will they be and how biologically sensitive are they to the climate conditions that are expected in the future. So this gives us some sense of the relative vulnerability of species to different climate conditions in the future. We then, but I should say, this is done at a shelf-wide scale. So across the Northeast Shelf, you have some sense of whether a species may be highly vulnerable, not so vulnerable, maybe going up, maybe going down, but you don't really know how that plays out at a local level. And providing information at a local level is really important for working with communities and thinking about how one particular place might be affected by those changes. So we also bring this information into some quantitative species distribution models. So these are distribution models that project the future um, habitat available to species based on sea surface temperature and depth. Um, so standard variables. And then we select models within potential futures for those species based on the qualitative expert assessment. So from this work, we then, this is just one example, we have these models available for 56 species for two seasons when the trial survey is conducted. So this is just one example looking at long fin squid. We have a baseline model that's played out over 2011 through 2015. Then we project temperatures for 2055 into that model and can look at the difference to understand where changes in that species may occur in the future. So in this case, you see that we are projecting that long fin squid will increase around the Gulf of Maine and then decline at the southern extent of its current range. But we also need to understand the local effects of these changes. How will the local communities be affected? And to do this, there are two key elements here. The first is we're taking those species distribution results and clipping them to portions of the ocean that are relevant to every fishing community that we're interested in. So we use um, vessel trip report data so that we can see where fishing vessels that operate out of a particular community are actually fishing, which portions of the ocean are they using, and how do we expect each of the species we're looking at to change within that particular footprint. So this gives us some sense of what changes um, might occur that would be locally relevant to them. In this case, um, just to show you a quick snippet of results for Portland, we see that we expect to have declines in a number of species that are important to fisheries in that port right now. Lobster, Atlantic herring, and pollock. We expect to see declines in all of those in the area that's currently being fished by vessels operating out of Portland. Um, but then another element here is what capacity do they have to adapt to those changes? So one piece of this puzzle is really looking at what species might be available to them in the future. Some of these are species that are already there and are not currently being fished. So things like Atlantic mackerel, Jonah crab, and sea scallops, we expect to increase. But they're already available. Maybe they will be species that would be more easily transitioned into. Um, or maybe there's a reason they're not catching them right now. Then we see a number of species moving in that are more traditionally thought of as mid-Atlantic species coming up from the south. Things like longfin squid, we've already heard a little bit about summer flounder, and we've heard quite a bit about black sea bass. And striped bass is another species that we see increasing in Portland. And this raises some really interesting questions because our work is focused on commercial fisheries, and certainly there are commercial fisheries for striped bass, but also raises the question of the potential shift in the balance of commercial and recreational fisheries in the future as well. So one part of community adaptation centers around the opportunities they may have to target other species, but it also relies on an intrinsic ability to adapt and to adjust to those changes. So we bring into this analysis some work that our collaborator Lisa Colburn at the Northeast Fisheries Science Center has led to try to understand 
the you know, vulnerability and resilience of different fishing communities along the coast. So this enables us to have some understanding of their likely ability to make change based on their social characteristics um, and how their community has already been changing. So the second element of this is really trying to go beyond sort of the broad understanding of potential vulnerability and how it varies across communities to understanding some of the actual impacts and evaluating specific adaptation strategies that communities might employ to buffer these impacts. So for this work, we're really focused on this component of the vulnerability assessment, just the um, social element, thinking about if you play out different adaptation strategies, how does that change the outcome? And we're focusing this work in four fishing communities. These are Stonington, Maine, Portland, Maine, New Bedford, Mass, and Point Judith, Rhode Island. We chose these to have a community sort of north, in the northern region, um, Stonington and Portland, that, are, that contrast each other in terms of the diversity of species they currently rely on in their fisheries. So Stonington is exclusively almost a lobster port. Portland harvests a much wider variety of species. New Bedford gets 85% um, of the value coming into that port is from sea scallops, whereas Point Judith relies on many different species. So in these four communities, we've been going out and doing workshops and interviews to try to understand what people are thinking about as potential adaptation strategies that they think um, may be worth considering in the future. And these focus on things like things that industry could do itself. So we've already seen in the case of Gulf of Maine, or Maine lobster, after the 2012 heat wave, they've already adapted in certain ways by restructuring their supply chain, um, thinking about how they handle product, particularly during high temperature periods, how they can um, preserve the quality of lobsters they bring to the dock, as well as marketing initiatives. Um, we're seeing on the water changes in fishing locations, and this is something that people talk about in terms of, you know, um, folks from Rhode Island traveling, you know, further south to catch species that they have access to because they have a permit for it. Um, people from the south traveling further north because the species they're targeting is moving north. Um, we're also seeing people change the target species they're fishing for, and this plays out at a port scale in some places. So we've seen, for example, in Point Judith, a really big shift from dependence on lobster and cod historically to now being a really big squid port, harvesting a lot of summer flounder and a variety of other species. And they're also talking about um, diversifying their catch, so less dependence on a single species in Maine. Um, Lobstermen are allowed to take five um, halibut a day during a short window of time, and you see almost all of them taking advantage of that. Um, but also thinking about, when will a squid be here long enough that I can maybe catch squid for part of the year? Um, and moving into aquaculture and other fishery-related industries as well. And then I think the, another strategy that we have heard a lot about, a lot more than I expected to hear about, is the potential for local seafood potential for fishermen to play a greater role in the seafood supply chain themselves. So thinking about direct sales, how they can you know, work more with their communities to sell their product there, shifting consumer preferences towards species that may not be as familiar, and also really thinking about the capacity to process these species. For example, in Point Judith, they're making a large investment in facilities to process scup which needs to be frozen before it can really be handled. Um, and New Bedford, um, I hear a lot about changes in the shoreside infrastructure there to support changes in the fisheries. So when we um, work with our economic models and play these strategies out in those models, I want you to ignore the graphs for a second, because um, I, the, I didn't put up here the adaptation strategies that we've really evaluated. The first element of this is understanding what would be the baseline impact if you continued operating the way you are now and fishing for the species you fish for now. Then if you adapted, in this case we allow them to adapt by targeting different species, optimizing the mix of gear they use to target those species, and changing their fishing area. So those are the three core strategies and then also combinations of those. And the key takeaways here, this is just for Stonington and Portland, can see that the impacts can be really substantial. 
without any form of adaptation. So there are clear benefits to adapting and even the potential to do better in the future if you adapt appropriately than you're doing at present. So these are relative profit ratios. So above one means you're doing better than at present. But the um, adaptation strategies that may be most beneficial will likely vary across the ports. In the case of Stonington, you can see that tapping into emerging species is going to be really important in that port. In the case of Portland, they get most of the adaptation benefit by optimizing the mix of gear to better take advantage of species that are available there. So, um, so really trying to develop approaches to objectively evaluate adaptation options and then playing those out, I think, is going to be valuable moving forward. And finally, we recognize that there are a variety of factors that can hinder or facilitate adaptation. So we're approaching this piece of the work in two different ways. One is trying to understand individual propensity to change. Um, we conducted a survey with individual fishermen to understand what they're seeing about related to the impacts of warming and how they might respond to that or how, they, how well they think they are ready to change. And this sort of figure here captures the construct that has shaped the survey. I won't go into details on that, but I will highlight some of the results that we're getting from this. The first is that fishermen feel really attached to their fisheries and they're really committed to doing things to manage it appropriately and sustain it into the future. What we're also seeing is that they believe that there is um, consensus that there's a need to change. And they think that they have the ability to change. They have the knowledge, they have skills, they have capacity to actually make a change. But where we see the results of this, the numbers um, really decline, is that they don't know what an appropriate change would be. And so I think the work that I showed you previously and further expansions of that type of work will be really important for honing in on what changes will be appropriate. And then finally, obviously there are facilitators and barriers at the institutional level, community level, <laughs> in our governance structures. These are just some of the things that we've gleaned from the interviews we've been conducting. And I just highlight here some of the things that I think are really exciting to think about is just the potential. Fishermen are entrepreneurs. They've always adjusted to changes in the ecosystem. They have a potential to adjust to future changes as well. So thinking about how we can better support that and align what is happening in the um, scientific advice and management to help move in that direction I think will be really important. But the barriers aren't just in the management system. It's been really interesting to hear about some of the financing mechanisms, insurance constraints, um, and the shore side elements that play into this. And I do just want to highlight this last piece. You know, the one barrier that people talk about a lot is the lag between the science and how sometimes science misaligns with fishermen's experience. And so I think that there's a real role there for us as scientists to work on how we bring observations into the management process through the scientific <laughs> advice that is provided. And so I just want to conclude by going back to the figure I showed you earlier. Obviously adaptation can happen at many scales. Right now we're seeing most of that adaptation playing out at, through decisions that individual fishermen are making, through industry actions and programs, and then at the community level, particularly I would say on the shoreside infrastructure front as they think about processing infrastructure and how to support vibrant fisheries and provide space for that in the future. We're not yet seeing um, a lot of changes in the management system that will help support, for example, access to emerging species. But certainly in terms of what Janet spoke about, changes in how we, how we view stock structure and how we maybe manage for different um, components of stocks will be really important there. And so I'm not going to read you all of this. I put up just a summary slide, but I think that some of the key elements here are that obviously there are clear benefits to adapting, and there's probably a need to really increase the pace of adaptation. Over the past decade, we've seen changes in the ecosystem that have emerged much more rapidly than changes in the human system. So thinking about how we can better align that pace, I think, will be really important for achieving goals that satisfy not just the social and economic needs of fisheries, the biological needs of populations, but also thinking about our conservation objectives moving forward as well. So I will um, leave it at that and be happy to take questions 
either now or during the break. Thanks. I think we have time for maybe one or two quick questions, but we do have a short uh, break time. So, uh, Professor Ringland. You had an intriguing term that I don't think you referred to, the gentrification of the that's a so I think that I threw up that term. It comes up in the social resilience indicator. So gentrification would be things like losing your working waterfront in a community and having it converted to other types of development. So, um, you know, development that is no longer centered around fisheries. And what I, I feel like we're seeing quite a bit of is that there's still this nostalgic tie, this cultural importance of fisheries. But in some cases, losing the presence of that, you know, really hardworking element of the waterfront. Is there another additional international fishing thing to consider out there that we're really not talking about when you do your best here? Is that out, waiting out there too? Is that an issue? I think there are lots of international issues. I mean, I think here, if working in Maine, we already are thinking about international issues in terms of the interplay with some of our stocks in Canada. And I think as you see stocks moving, there's lots of um, crossing over of management jurisdictions. But I think that um, in some ways, we can learn a lot from some of the international management structures that have been put in place for um, you know, sharing stocks as well as the, the process of allocation across U.S. and Canada for some of our ground fish stocks is a process that really bases that allocation on observations from year to year in terms of how the distribution has changed. So I think there are, there's lots to learn from international experiences and also lots of cases where this will be showing up in, across international boundaries. How far out is the line? Oh, right 200 um, miles. Oh, that's good. Okay, I think we will there, but thank you, Kathy. That was great, and I love the way you talked to us. So we have a 15-minute break. Please come back promptly so we can stay on schedule. Thank you. If you're speaking in this room after the break, please bring your talk to the front of the room.